So uh, my name is uh, Jose Baeza. I work at uh, uh, Polytechnic University Hospital La Fe in, in Valencia. Wait a moment, please. Uh, I'm orthopedic surgeon and I'm dedicated to the field of uh, osteoarticular infections, especially periperiostatic joint infection and osteomyelitis. So first I would like to thank MBA for giving us the opportunity to share with uh, Dr. Indeli his knowledge uh, regarding periperiostatic joint infection and the use of calcium uh, sulfate. He's going to talk uh, about DAPRI, an innovative technique for the management of PGI, presentation of a prevention uh, protocol. And um, uh, please let me introduce you, Dr. Francesco uh, Indeli. He is clinical professor in adult reconstruction uh, from the Department of Orthopedic Surgery at the Stanford University School of Medicine, California. Uh, he received his medical degree from the University of Florence and he completed his residence in orthopedic surgery at uh, 1000 night at the same university. From uh, 2000 to 2002 was postdoctoral research fellow at the division of orthopedic surgery at the Stanford University. He completed two clinical fellowships, one of, the, one of them in sports medicine at the University of Arizona and another one in adult reconstruction at Duke University. He received a doctorate of philosophy in orthopedic surgery from the University of Florence in 2014, presenting a thesis on rotational landmark in primary total uh, near arthroplasty. He's been with the University of Florence from nine, uh, 2009 to uh, 2014, joining the faculty as an assistant professor in adult reconstruction at the Department of Orthopedic Surgery. He served as tenured clinical assistant professor in adult reconstruction at the Department of Orthopedic Surgery and Rehabilitation at the University of New Mexico. He has, he has more than uh, 40 international peer review published papers and 151 peer review international presentation and honored with several academic awards. He is member of numerous uh, scientific uh, societies, as you can see in the slide, and his research interest includes rotational al alignment of the components in primary total knee arthroplasty, clinical difference between medial and medial pivot and posterior esta stabilized design in total knee arthroplasty, mid flexion instability in total knee arthroplasty, and clinical use of mesenchymal stem cells from human lipoaspirate. He's married and he has two children. He lives in Stanford, California, USA. His grandfather, I know, was Argentinian, so uh, he's fan of the football team Boca Juniors. And I know, and I think it's true, he's an excellent tango dancer. So uh, we are lucky. And uh, we have with us two international experts in musculoskeletal infection and periprostatic joint infection. One of them is Dr. Juan Carlos Martinez Pastor. He's the head of the knee department, hospital clinic from Barcelona. And Ricardo, Dr. Ricardo Sousa from orthopedic department, Centro Hospitalar Universitario do Porto, Portugal. And, and that's all. I, th I think you are enjoy. Everybody uh, is going to enjoy the presentation uh, from Dr. Indeli. Indeli, and if you want, Dr. Indeli, you can go on or go ahead uh, with your presentation. Thank you, uh, Dr. Indeli, for being there, and I'm sure I'm, uh, you will enjoy. When you want, Dr. Indeli. Yes, thank you. Can you see the screen? Yeah, fantastic. Uh, Jose, thank you for the very kind words. And uh, it's just a pleasure to be with you guys. You know, I'm European, so, and I'm a Southern European and I'm very proud of being a Southern European. So, so, so uh, thank you for this opportunity. Thank you to uh, MBA for, for putting this one uh, together. And uh, 
Yeah, we are going to talk today about uh, uh, DAPRI and this uh, technique for uh, debridement, uh, antibiotic pearls, and retention of the implants in a PJI acute uh, setting. Um, I have no financial interest in any device discussing the current presentations. I have some institutional uh, conflicts, but, uh, but not, uh, nothing regarding this uh, presentation. So I want to just use, you know, spend two words, talk about Stanford and, uh, and uh, why I end out there. <laughs> um, Stanford University was founded in uh, 1885 by Senator uh, Leland Stanford. Uh, to promote the public welfare uh, in the state of California. He lost a child, the only child, the um, uh, doctor and, and Mrs. Stanford, they lost their child, Leland Jr., during a trip to Africa in 1884. And she, he act, actually died, died in Florence. So they decide to put their other efforts uh, and the family Stanford aim to the university to be non-sectarian, co-educational and affordable. They aim to produce cultural, cultured and useful graduates. Uh, and uh, at the beginning, Stanford University uh, was well known because of their studies in liberal arts, technology and engineering. Um, later on in life, uh, Terry, four years ago, you know, our alumni, you know, Bill El Elwitt uh, and David Packard, Hewlett Packard uh, founder, the Varian Brothers, and as you might know, the first uh, desktop computer was developed uh, at the Stanford Arti Artificial Intelligence Lab, you see the building there, in 1971. So uh, for many years we were well known for, for um, high tech and technology, but uh, I think we are, we are doing a decent job in, in medicine. We have uh, 15, 16,000 students. We have uh, 2,000 and almost 300 faculty members. This student to faculty ratio is very high, uh, five to one. Uh, we have a great budget from public and, and private institutions for our research, more than 1.5 million. Uh, and we have seven schools and you see medicine there. Uh, but uh, we have uh, only seven, seven uh, uh, schools, uh, not, not that many. So uh, let's talk about uh, our, our uh, topic of the day, the periprosthetic joint infection. And uh, I want to share with you some news on conservative uh, treatments. Um, as you know, in Philadelphia, um, 800 delegates in 2019, and few of you guys were there, participate to the uh, second international consensus meeting. And one of, one of the, the first uh, um, uh, papers that came out uh, is this paper on, on uh, why a uh, uh, periprosthetic joint infection can be defined as an acute infection and why and when the conservative treatment is, is indicated for uh, a PJI. So, there was a very strong consensus, 94% of consensus, in the fact uh, that uh, uh, acute infections are those infections which are diagnosed in the first four weeks from the symptoms, not from the surgery. And the better results with a conservative uh, treatment are obtained if the treatment is given in the first seven days, the first week, from, from symptoms appearance. And there is no more difference between early post-op and acute hematogenous. Another very strong consensus was found on the, the fact, and I discussed already with uh, Jose um, a few minutes ago, the fact that uh, the acute PJI, an acute periprosthetic joint infection is a medical and surgical urgency. As soon as the patient is medically and, and uh, surgically optimized, it should be treated. Um, historically, uh, the simple irrigation and debridement, uh, dire, has shown very low efficacy. Uh, two thirds of the cases fail. Uh, the acute infections have best change of cure. The streptococcal infections have a, have a better success rate. The staphylococcal infections and the MRSA have a very high uh, failure rate, up to uh, 80%. Uh, 
Um, I want to share with you this uh, uh, meta-analysis, the review from uh, Fares, from Dr. Haddad, and uh, he, he produced this paper uh, just in 2018, uh, two years minimum follow-up review, meta-analysis, almost uh, 850 patients, and the simple debridement, antibiotics, and implant retections, um, it has a very low success rate. Uh, 65%, and for, for us, 65 is it, low, and we can discuss about that, but uh, um, the, the best success rate is in those patients with less comorbidities, and many times those are not our, our patients. So um, the first thing you should do today uh, at the end of this, uh, of this uh, 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 presentation is to download this app from your iPhone or, or Google phone. Uh, it's the it's a, a ACM Philly app, and you can see there there is a, a, a window where you can uh, calculate the success rate of your debridement and implant retention. You put there your patient comorbidities, the patient demo demographics, the uh, procedure that the patient had before, uh, the complications of the procedure, and all your uh, labs and cultural results, and you can really calculate the uh, uh, rate of success of your uh, irrigation and debridement. Um, how we manage periprosthetic joint infection at Stanford. So again, acute infections uh, for us, the, the treatment is this one that I'm going to talk to you about, the debridement, antibiotic pairs, and retention of implant, DAPRI. In the chronic setting, setting we do only double state revision. We don't do single state revision for uh, legal issues, medical legal issues. So this is what we do uh, here and I'm hoping to discuss uh, uh, these strategies. Uh, debridement, antibiotic pairs, and retention of the implants, DAPRI. Um, we use it and we suggest to use it only in acute setting. And when we presented this technique uh, first in 2019, uh, we consider acute the four weeks from symptoms and, uh, and again, in the first uh, seven days, because we look at, at the uh, consensus conference, um, we perform DAPRI only, and I, I like that, only when we have unknown bacterium, but from the antibiogram, from culture, or from next generation sequencing. And we built a custom made antibiotic parts uh, in relationship to the antibiogram. So as you, as you know, the biofilm uh, grows very fast. It's a coating of uh, uh, exopolysaccharide protecting uh, the, the, the implant from uh, antibiotics and uh, antibodies. And in 72 hours, it's mature. And that is a procedure which address, address the, the biofilm. So um, it's a real uh, open exploration we take five specimens for uh, culture and sensitivity. It's a, a tumor-like debridement guided by uh, the methylene blue, and I'll show you how. Um, we use the argon beam uh, electrocoagulator uh, on the uh, um, components. We use a chlorhexidine uh, scrubbing brush. We add the calcium sulfate uh, antibiotics beads. We irrigate with nine liters of warm saline added with bacitracin. Uh, or chlorhexidine or betadine. Uh, I personally use bacitracin. Some of my colleagues use chlorhexidine or betadine. We do the poly polyethylene insert exchange and we keep a, a drain uh, in, uh, in the joint for 48 to 72 hours. So uh, we, this is a case, this is a typical case, is a total knee. So first of all, we want, we want to identify, we want to highlight the biofilm. So we, we, we prepare a, a 50 cc of a, a saline plus 0.5% methylene blue. We inject it in the knee prior to the procedure. We do three or four range of motion. Um, maneuvers, and then we, we aspirate the, the uh, methylene blue. And when you do your capsulotomy, everything blue, everything inside the joint is contaminated by the biofilm. It needs to be removed. So you, you have to be patient and, 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 and it takes time to remove 
all the uh, contaminated biofilm from the, from the soft tissues. And then uh, we, we, we start thinking about uh, using something else on the components on the surfaces of the, of the implants. Uh, st studies have shown that an electrical current applied to a stainless steel implant infected with staff or strap, um, in that case, the current was able to enhance the detachment, the breakage of the biofilm. So we, st we start using, we start using uh, uh, the argon beam coagulator on the, on the femoral component, the, the tibial component. This is the setting, 120 vats, uh, 50 degrees. This is done, and that's the, the system. This is done to break the biofilm, just to get uh, access to, to the microorganism. And it takes very few minutes. In a couple of minutes, we do both components. Um, then we went in the lab, and this is data from a from, um, few weeks ago. We, we, we tried to look which, is, which was the best power the, for the setting of the machine. Originally, we were using one, 120 watts. Now we start using 60 watts because we saw there was uh, efficient in, in destroying the biofilm on an agar uh, plate in our uh, lab. So now we set the, the, the system at 60 watts. Um, and then we do the chlor chlorexidine scrubbing. Uh, we take a, a chlorexidine brush and we scrub it. We scrub very hardly. This is done to remove the, the biofilm uh, from the component surfaces after uh, we broke through with the, with the electrocoagulator. Um, and then we use the beads, you know, the beads like uh, uh, I do, they are uh, pharmaceutical grade uh, calcium sulfate uh, with this unique crystal structure. Uh, it has a, a physiologic pH level, is hydrophilic, and they are completely absorbed at an optimal rate at 30, 40 days from, from uh, surgery. And the most important thing is that the elution time is up to 40 days. So the elution of the uh, antibiotic over the uh, MIC lasts for, for 30, 40 days. And this is very different from what happens from the elution of the antibiotic from, from, uh, from our uh, standard cement spacer. And we know from the literature that the antibiotic elution, it's behind the MIC only the first 72 hours from placement in the joint, three days. So the stimulant preparation, again, you know this one like, a, like I do, this is for a 10 cc of, of stimulant. This is the, uh, the, the standard mix, uh, uh, again, according to the uh, culture and the antibiogram. In this case, we use one gram of Vanco plus one gram of Tobra. Uh, we mix it, we have our scaffold, and the beads are usually uh, ready in uh, 10 to uh, 15 minutes. And uh, at the end of the procedure, we, we just uh, uh, place it uh, on the sovra patella uh, pouches and then uh, after the uh, poly exchange. So, so you know, uh, we wait a little bit before, before you know, publishing this, uh, this, uh, this uh, technique because we wanna see our results at two years follow up, you know. Uh, uh, earlier than that probably was, was, was not right to do. So in our 10 patients, our first 10 patients, 90% males, average age, uh, uh, almost 70 years, IBMI, these are, you know, uh, US veterans. And so they, they're not skinny. Um, the original surgery was a primary total knee followed by acute or early hematogenous uh, PJI. Uh, with unknown, again, with unknown microorganisms before the surgery. The organism was uh, the staph aureus in 60% of the cases, 20% of the cases was MRSA, a strep uh, 30%, and uh, granular cutella uh, 10%. So we, we, we performed the, the surgery, uh, as I was uh, telling Jose and, and Ricardo and Juan Carlos, we do it very quickly. As soon as the patients have symptoms, we try to do it. And, uh, and that's a, it, it's a medical urgency. So, so, so in this series, we did the surgery uh, in the average two days from the symptoms, one to four days. Um, after the, the DAPRI, patients underwent six weeks of uh, uh, 
IV uh, antibiotic therapy and then six weeks of oral antibiotic therapy. Uh, all patients were available two years and uh, in 80% of the patients at two years, they were, there was negativization of the serologic markers and there was a recurrence of the PJI and the splint of the total knee in 20%. So this was our first experience. And then we re recently published our second experience in the hip. So, so this is the first trial, uh, 10 patients, again, two years minimum follow-up. You, you see average age uh, 74, uh, IBMI2, uh, primarily uh, total hip. This was done, uh, uh, the DAPRI was done within four weeks from, from the uh, symptoms. We, again, with a known microorganism before the surgery. Uh, the, or, in the PGI organism were uh, Steph Auro, 60%, Strep 20, uh, uh, and uh, E. coli, uh, 10%, the MRSA was 20% of the cases. So again, DAPRI was done three days from symptoms. Uh, uh, again, same protocol, six weeks of, of IV plus six weeks of or antibiotic therapy. All patients were available and follow up. In this case, we had uh, one year of minimum follow up and we have the same uh, uh, outcomes. Uh, we have a recurrence of the PJI with the explant of the total hip in 20%, so 80% success rate. Um, it's very important to follow the indications. Uh, this paper from my friend, uh, Craig De La Valle uh, in Chicago, uh, he reviewed 32 uh, patients with an acute PJI uh, and uh, 14 patients with a post-op, uh, 48 patients. They didn't isolate the bacterium before uh, the uh, dire. There was not a, a bacterium specific antibiotic in uh, calcium sulfate beads and the success rate in this series is pretty low, 50% at uh, one year. So it's very important to follow the steps. Um, I wanna talk just a few minutes about prevention and because uh, in general, uh, musculoskeletal uh, preventions and, and PGI preventions because uh, a couple of, of years ago, I started working with some European colleagues from the University of Milan and from the uh, Sapienza University in Rome. And we start thinking about uh, uh, putting together a protocol to a preventive uh, protocol for PJI. Um, uh, I work, uh, uh, I'm board, board member of the ECA. So I have a few friends there and we put together a panel of experts from, the, from ECA. And, uh, and uh, we did a very deep review of the literature, the uh, Academy ACAS ESCA guidelines. We reviewed more than 175 articles in, in order to, to put together a new preventive protocol based on PGI risk, quantification and stratification in primary and revision total neurotoplasty. Uh, we recently published our first paper. Again, this is not a consensus document from ECA. We'll probably want to do that. We want to do a survey, but this is the, the first, you know, the first uh, um, uh, publication on, on, on this uh, protocol. And we look at OS factors. We look at surgical and environmental factors. We look at microbial factors, and we highlight uh, three steps. Uh, three preventive steps, uh, preoperative, uh, intraoperative, and, and postoperative. Um, and again, uh, download your app. And if you look at uh, the fantastic work that you know, Timothy Tan and then Antonia Chen and Jay Pervizzi did uh, um, on, on this topic, uh, you, know, you, can, you can quantify the PGI risk for every single patient of yours when they undergo primary or revision total joint anthroplasty. So uh, basically uh, there is a, a point value system. So every, every demographic uh, factor, surgical factors, comorbidities, they have a, a point uh, value. And for example, you can, you can uh, this is one of my patients, uh, BMI 28, male, uh, Medicare, so over 65, smoker, no history of drug abuse, uh, primary total knee, he had a previous arthroscopic surgery, he, he has uh, uncontrolled diabetes and his PJI risk is 12%. So uh, we look at those, uh, at those uh, scores and, 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 and uh, we decide to you know, uh, define, uh, try to highlight uh, patients at uh, an high risk for PJI in primary revision. And we decide to 
put the, the threshold at 130 point, 130 points, 10 percent of relative risk of PJI. And we try to apply these preoperative, intraoperative, and postoperative measures to prevent the development uh, of an infection, a PJI, in high risk patients. And uh, we start with the antibiotic prophylaxis. Uh, I'm sure I'm going to have some questions here because this is uh, a matter of high debate worldwide. In standard patients, we are used to use the two grams of uh, cefazolin only for 24 hours. In high risk patients, there is a, a strong suggestion from the current literature to, to do a, a double antibiotic coverage, cefazolin plus gentamicin. I just want to share with you this paper from uh, Michael Meneghini from the University of Indiana. And uh, he states that uh, in his iris patients, it continues, it prolongs his antibiotic prophylaxis for up to seven days after the surgery. Uh, and then what we can do intraoperatively uh, for every uh, standard patients on the left side, this is what, what we do with our standard patients. There is a double skin preparation. Uh, betadine plus chlorexidine. We do the irrigation with uh, diluted betadine. Uh, the betadine is 0.63% uh, uh, concentrated. And we do after implant positioning in the standard patients, we do twice before and after implant positioning in high risk patients. And then we use uh, two grams of tranexanthic uh, acid um, IV. The suture, we use a single strand uh, burp suture and mesh adhesive glue in both cases. And then we use the aqua cell hydro fiber uh, dressing. But again, the difference between standard patients and iris patients is basically the, the double irrigation with, with diluted uh, uh, beta dying. Uh, and then the antibiotic local delivery uh, in iris patients. This is a good combo suggested by the uh, literature, but you can talk to your to, to your uh, rep and, and decide on your own what kind of antibiotic mix you want to use for your uh, beads. Uh, we use gentamicin 240 milligram plus one gram of vancomycin for every 10 cc of calcium sulfate uh, beads we use as a, a preventive measure. And then post these steps. So this is very important. Uh, we reviewed the, the literature on this and this is what we look at. And, and this slide, again, uh, to me, it's very important for the, the you know, for everyday orthopedic surgeon. So early discharge is, is, is highly recommended for high risk patients. And day one, we should check uh, a few serologic markers. You see ESR, CRP, uh, D-dimer. And if you see the D-dimer as a peak in, in postoperative day two, but it should be normal by postoperative post-operative day uh, three. One check at one week, at two weeks, we re remove the prenatal, we check again ESR, T-dimer, CRP. The CRP, the C-reactive protein, should be normal at two weeks from surgery. Again, at six weeks from surgery, X-ray, ESR, CRP, D-dimer, all of three, they should be normal at, at six weeks. And we do the same thing at three months. And uh, again, if we have not the dimer decrease in postoperative day two, in, in, if there is no uh, C-reactive protein decrease at two weeks, if the, sero if the serologic markers are not normal at six weeks, there is high suspicion of an early PGI. And synovial fluid analysis can be a uh, uh, step because we are still, we can be still in, in, on time for a DAPRI procedure. So uh, this is our first trial, it's not being published. These are patients coming from, from Stanford, from the University of, uh, of Rome, and from the uh, uh, University of Milan in Bergamo. Uh, 27 patients, we have an average age of 75 um, years. The average preoperative relative risk, in this case series, is 15%, between 3.5 and 63%. You see the, the index procedure, uh, total hip, five patients, revision hip, nine patients, revision shoulder, two patients, primarily uh, totally seven patients, revision knee, uh, four patients. Uh, this is the first result. All patients were available at one year minimum follow-up. Uh, patients were followed uh, according to the protocol that I show you. We didn't have any periprosthetic joint infection. 
we, 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 we had uh, 3% of cases of uh, aseptic wound drainage uh, from, from the wound. This is a well-known uh, complication of the uh, uh, calcium sulfate uh, beads use, uh, but that's, that's an aseptic drainage. It's not uh, an infection. And the serologic markers uh, for PJI were, were noted and they elevated in uh, two cases, but the patients were asymptomatic. So um, in conclusion, and I, I, I hope I stay in my, my time, uh, to date, uh, implant retection in a PJI scenario should be performed only, very important, in acute infections, four weeks from symptoms, in conjunction with the microorganism isolation. Um, the biofilm identification and removal combined with the local delivery of antibiotic plus uh, 12 weeks of systemic antibiotic therapy represent a very promising form of conservative treatment for acute, again, acute PJI. Um, PJI risk patients, I risk patients should be evaluated and treated following different uh, preoperative clinical pathways respect to the normal population. The PJI risk should be individually quantified in order to apply, we call it personalized measures and, uh, and the implementation of a PGI preventive protocol like this one that we are proposing might appear costly, absolutely. And I know the cost of, of all those uh, uh, measures in Europe, but in the short term, they might be costly, but extremely gratifying in the long one. And uh, thank you. I just wanna, you know, I'm part of ESCA and ECA. Uh, for somebody who wants to you know, know more about periprostatic infection, we just talked about prevention today and conservative treatment, uh, you should uh, sign up for this great uh, um, periprostatic joint infection webinar from ESCA on Wednesday, February 10. I personally thank uh, uh, Professor uh, uh, Faris Sadat for doing this and my friend Daniel uh, Perez Prieto from Barcelona. He worked with me on the preventive uh, uh, protocol and I want to thank him and don't forget the uh, ESCA, ESCA uh, Congress in, in uh, May will be virtual from, from home May 11 to May uh, 15, 2021 and with this one I I think uh, Thank you Thank I'm you done. Thank you very, uh, Dr. Indeli, Indeli for your fantastic presentation I enjoyed the presentation. In my case, I'm using calcium sulfate in osteomyelitis, osteomyelitis and uh, I would like the, to combine me to using periperistoric joint infection on all the people is here in Arch. So we have prepared many questions. Maybe we have more or less 30 minutes to, to ask you questions. And we are three people and I think you are you are going to enjoy the question as well as your presentation. So if you want, uh, Dr. Juan Carlos, uh, you want to start? Do you want to start? Okay. Of course, thank you, Jose. Uh, congratulations, Professor Indeli. Uh, I have enjoyed a lot with your presentation, but I, I have some questions that on the first one is uh, you have uh, explained your theory what important criteria to detect therapy. That is to know the microorganisms, is okay? And the antibiogram before the surgery, this correct, no? And you have an average time to perform the DAPRI more or less or two days, from one, four, maybe two days, of average time to perform the DAPRI, no? It's okay? Yes. You operate yes. very fast, you operate very fast. But normally in our institution, we have the microorganisms result more or less in five, six days, and the antibiogram a little bit more. Of course, it is faster in the aureus, but have you explained how you found the lab so fast, only today? Do you have a good friend in lab, micro lab? Uh, that's, that's a great question. And the answer is uh, genetics. So next generation sequence, the same thing that we are doing with COVID right now. At the beginning of COVID, we were having an answer, a response using PCR, in two to three days. Now with next generation sequencing, with uh, DNA sequencing of the, of the microorganisms, you can have an answer in six hours. I know it's very expensive. I know it's not available ev everywhere. And I know that we are talking about the future, but, uh, but uh, 
this is what we do these things. And I think we should focus uh, on genetics very much. I think the fifth member of our team needs to be a genetist now. No, not, you know, an orthopedic surgeon, anesthesiologist, internal medicine, infection disease, and genetist. So this is the fifth okay. member. Okay, and do you use the world genome sequencing? World genome? Yeah, we, do. we do NGS. Yes, so and do you, have the, you, can do, you can do the antibiogram? Do you have yes. the antibiogram? Genome? Yes, also? So, uh, so it's a, not an isolation, it's an identification. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, okay, no. so so it's not an antibiogram. You know the bug, but you don't know the antibiotic, which that microorganism is sensitive, right? And that's a great question. But you know, at least you know who you are dealing with. Okay. But but that that's that's a very good question. Uh, we don't have the antibiogram with the NGS, but we have the bug. So you know you know you know who you have to shoot to but you don't know how many bullets or what kind of bullets you need. But, you know, yeah. if you think that three years ago we, we were waiting a week to have cultural response, right? And then well, some yeah. bugs are, you know, cultural negative. We have 45, 50% of our PJI, they're cultural negative. I think it's Europe is the same. So yeah, NGS yeah. is bypassing that. Okay, for the reason we don't why to obtain the microbiology results, we operate with the clinical symptoms and the suspicions and maybe with the biochemical lab only, you know, because we can wait for a week to do the the dry the diet. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Oh. Uh, John Carlos, in that in that scenario, probably is, you know, use a, a broad spectrum antibiotic, right? So I had uh, at Banco and Tobra, Banco and Tobra to your beads, right? Yeah. Oh, Doctor Indeli, a question. Uh, that's why you with withhold the antibiotics pre or the surgical intervention because you 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 have the identification but not the antibiogram. So, so uh, yes. do, so, did you understand so, the question? Because you get anti and then the, that's why you with withhold the anti the antibiotics previous to the surgical uh, intervention. You say great question. If you use next generation sequencing. That's independent from the preoperative antibiotic dose. So if patients have broad spectrum antibiotics given by the primary care physicians and you do NGS, next generation sequencing, also PCR sequencing, the same technology we use for COVID, you can identify the bacterium independently from the preoperative pre antibiotic. But again, we are talking about expensive technology but it's available and it's going to be more and more available. Yeah. Dr. Sousa, if you want. Yeah, uh, thank you, Professor Indeli. I was listening to your presentation very carefully and I was just thinking and structuring my ideas because we are talking about stimulant and stimulant is just a way to deliver local antibiotics in high concentration. That's just what it is. It's a means for local antibiotic delivery. It has the, the advantages for high local antibiotics and has some potential advantages, as you've shown us some of them, like persistent drainage is one of them. And perhaps hypercalcemia is another one, but this is just a means for antibiotics. And of course, I agree that the last part of your talk, it's prevention in high risk patients must be tailor-made and customized and perhaps uh, stimulant as a role there, not for all patients because of course of the price and the potential problem. And it's very interesting that we are also using it, especially in tumor prosthesis after, after tumor surgery. And that we consider those are very high risk patients and we are indeed using stimulant. And perhaps because of the, um, of the soft tissues that are not, not as good after soft tissue, after tumor uh, reconstruction. And then we have a bigger problem than that with drainage. But I agree with that prevention. And the, the whole of your talk was about uh, selection criteria for there. And of course, I totally agree with you, duration of symptoms, type of microorganism, 
some technical aspects of the surgery are very important and you describe some of them. And again, stimulant is a means for local antibiotic treatment. So I have a few questions regarding antibiotic protocols. The, the first is, if you do only there or DAPRI when you know the microorganism, why do you use uh, broad spectrum antibiotics in the stimulant beads? Uh, you, you, that's the first question. And the second question, I, I'm sure you didn't address it because of lack of time in your presentation, but it's very, very important, is continuation antibiotic therapy after the DARE procedure. And you, you don't, didn't mention antibiofilm therapy that I think is critical. We all know it's critical for the success. And the other thing I was curious is about the reasoning for six weeks IV antibiotics. If you are giving stimulant, you have a high local concentration of antibiotics. Why don't you switch for oral sooner than that? The great questions, Ricardo. Uh, let's start. Uh, let's start with the uh, few questions there. So I try to put things together. Yeah, I'm but sorry. I'm sorry. This is just no, I love it. I love it, Ricardo. That was that was great. So so uh, drainage. Okay, this is something that we see with stimulant, right? We see. You know, the word casistic, statistic, 3%, 7%, 10%, depends from the, from the surgeons, right? But, uh, my, and this is something coming from my residents. They start using IVAC therapy in every single DAPRI. And it's not in the protocol, it's not in the papers, it's something where we are start using in the last few months. But that's a great point, Ricardo. I don't know if you're familiar with IVAC, I'm sure you are. Uh, and that's something that uh, we, I'm thinking, and maybe we can share ideas here, how to apply the IVAC, right? Uh, for how long, uh, you know, a week, five days, we know that the drainage usually lasts uh, seven to 10 days, something like that. I like to seal my, 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 my uh, wound with, with uh, uh, pre-nail, right? And with this, with this glue. So how, you know, we apply the, we apply the IVAC, but I don't want to have a complication of my eye glue sealing of the wound. So we are working on that, but that's for the drainage. Again, we started a few months ago and uh, I don't have data, so I don't want to say anything, but it looks promising using the IVAC. Regarding the, the, uh, the dire, the uh, length of uh, IV, uh, antibiotic therapy and the fact that I use broad, broad, why I use broad spectrum antibiotics? Two questions. I use both broad spectrum antibiotics because if you look at the next generation sequencing papers, many, many, many of our PJI are polymicrobial. So, and, uh, and when you do the N NGS testing, you can highlight six, seven different microbes organism in your PJI. There is one dominant, but there are five or six recessive. That's the reason that I do poly, poly uh, use different antibiotics to cover gram positive and gram negative. Um, third question, the dire. The length of the therapy, I don't decide that. Those are my infection disease specialists. And there is a huge difference between Europe and United States. And we had a big fight at the consensus consensus meeting uh, because uh, Europeans, the Europeans, they want to stop the antibiotic therapy and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, not uh, uh, prolong the IV therapy for more than a week or so. They want to go oral right away. The American approach is six weeks to everybody. So I don't have an answer for that other than a cultural difference between Europe and US. We use, we use uh, uh, antibiotic windows here before reimplantation. So for example, you do your 12 weeks of antibiotics that you wait two months, check all your serology markers, and then eventually, if negative, you reimplant the joint. I know in Europe, there are few centers at least, at least in Italy, where they prolong the antibiotic therapy at the point of the reimplantation. And I don't know how you guys do, and it would be great to hear from you. So 
Uh, and I, but again, that's a that's an infection disease uh, uh, approach, and and uh, they have different approaches worldwide. And I don't know if you know what 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 you do, but uh, you know at that point uh, when when I'm done with the surgery, infection disease take over, and and I don't see the patient uh, you know until they when they think it's going to be time for implantation according to their protocols. Thank you, uh, Dr. Juan Carlos. Another question. Do you have another question? Yes, I have different questions, but one of them is uh, so in Delhi and our area, we have uh, achieved the world result with diet, normal diet, in acute hematogenous infection with staph powder. Uh, the rate of failure is less than 50% in cases. In our studies, in the acute post surgical infection is different. We had very good results, and uh, even with staph aureus, and uh, it's not different between methicillin sensitivity or resistance, and the rate, the rate of failure is about 25% more or less. Uh, but in this way, we're studying how to improve uh, the results of that in these cases with other techniques. And one thing that we have thought was to use the stimulant with vancomycin, like you use in that. But it seems that the staph aureus in your series is one of the most important microorganisms related to the failure. It's okay. Would you use the DAPRI also? Absolutely, okay. absolutely. And maybe the DAPRI is in these cases is not to solve the infection. What do you propose like alternatives? Because this is the way that we thought to use. Use a stimulant with vancomycin inside the knee uh, in cases of staph aureus with very bad results in acute hematogenous. But what is your alternative in this case? <laughs> so, uh, I, I talk about uh, uh, legal medicine in the United States, right? So that's the reason that we, do, we, do, uh, we don't do single stage. And I know in Europe, you guys do single stage. You do single stage while, while you isolate the microorganism. And, uh, and you know, there, there are protocols from UK. Uh, here, you know, the... the if you saw my the numbers of my uh, of our uh, cases, they're very low. The threshold for a, a two stage revision is very low. So mm -hmm. anytime you know something doesn't look right, or, or the microorganism is, we think is too is too aggressive, or, or we think that the combination of the antibiotics in Dapri, we do two stage. So I do. 95% of two stage and 5% of DEPRI, or maybe 3% of DEPRI. So there is no alternative answering your question. You know, if something but, doesn't sound right, right we resplant. Okay, did you isolate with frequency and staph aureus in acute uh, hematogenous infection? Do you perform daily to a stage revision? Or you try to do a DEPRI before? If it's in the first week, from symptoms, I do DAPRI. <laughs> okay. If it's more than one oh, week, I do two. That's what I do. Because again, again, uh, you said, you know, uh, legal issues here are very high. Think about that many things that I show you in DAPRI, they are not FDA approved, right? So the use of the argon beam coagulator on a component is something that has been published. We do it, we call off label because there is yeah. enough yeah. evidence in the literature that may help, but it's not a FDA approved procedure. So, you know, the balance is very tight. Yeah. So, so you understand okay. that, so. I normally use one cell revision for chronic infection. I have the core criteria, isolated microorganism, very good sensitivity for the antibiotic, a very good skin cover. But our experience with uh, acute infection the specific really with one stage is not so good. A very yeah. bad result. Of course, with two stage is even uh, the more result that with chronic infection. Uh, but I try to do first a diet. At the Brian is not a proposed to do two stage revision. But I don't uh, go directly to do the two stage revision. Thank you. Okay. So, Thank Doctor you. In, Doctor Indeli, we have two questions for the audience. So. Maria Baena, if you want, you can, uh, because I can see the questions. Maria? Uh, yes. Um, 
Dr. Indeli, there are two questions from the Dr. Pablo Sam from Madrid. He would like to know, uh, well, he writes, this, dear uh, Professor Indeli, the problem to use molecular tests is that they are less sensitive than normal cultures. Do you test this comparative uh, with normal microbiological tests? That's the first question. And the second one is, what genetic test do you use? 16 ribosomic DNA or a specific sequence? Thank you. Yes, uh, the answer is yes. So 16 uh, ribosomic uh, RNA. We use the Oxford Nanopore technology. And, uh, and uh, I have a genetist in my lab and uh, she usually able to uh, identify the microorganism in uh, four, four to six hours, okay? So what we do, we do, you know, we have the suspect of a PJI, right? So we do our arthrosynthesis, we send it for culture and sensitivity, and then we do the, the uh, NGS. So uh, in the case that, uh, that uh, you know, we, we isolate, uh, uh, with, we identif identify with the, with the uh, NGS, you know, we, we know what kind of microorganism we have. And again, it's a, it's a very expensive technology, but you can have an answer in, in six hours, okay. I don't know if any of you guys is, is using this genetic technology or fast uh, uh, in, uh, PCR uh, sequencing for, for PJI on when you have a suspect of infection, you know, from synovial fluid or, 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 it's, a, or it's a still a standard you know, culture and sensitivity. We use a standard culture. So we don't have uh, any GS, we don't have it. I, I would like to have it, but I, I think I, I, I want to speak to the director, to the manager to, to buy them. So I would like, but we, we use uh, uh, culture. And you, Juan Carlos? So, sir. Well, normally, normally we use the conventional microbiology study with culture, but we have tried with RNA, the 16S, but with no very good results. And I don't use routinely. I have when you use uh, solid uh, tissue, it's better than the liquid in the RNA 16A, but it's not a technique that you use uh, in routine in our laboratory, in our lab. In our practice. Yeah, here, here in Porto, we do have it in the university and we do use it occasionally for, especially for very high suspicion of chronic infection and we use it for culture negative. But day-to-day -day practice, we base our decisions on, on standard microbiology. And, and can, can I ask a question, Dr. Baeza? Yes, yeah, yes, yeah, of course. Again, do, do just, uh, just to... Uh, something that Juan Carlos asked you, and I wasn't very clear about the answer. Uh, if you're deciding that you're going to do a DAPRI and in two days, and now I understand why you have such quick turn at the result from the lab, because you use that ne next generation sequencing, but do you really base your decision on according to the microorganism? If there is Staphylococcus, we know that it is a very high failure rate. Or if there is a polymicrobial infection, then you don't do it there. Is, did I understand correctly? Is that the, the your decision? If you, in a couple of, or six hours you have the the result from NGS, it's polymicrobial, it's Staphylococcus. You don't do it there, even uh, if it's one week after the surgery. Ricardo, uh, the time the time will make me. Uh, suggest the approach. You know, if it's really acute, the patient was okay two days ago, and then he had big effusion, clear acute infection with a staph uh, aurus, also a MRSA, I do DEPRI. If it's been a week, 10 days, two weeks, we don't know, I don't. But that's a great point, okay? Even if I have the identification of the microorganism, but the the uh, and again, there being consensus of that seven days, right? What we can call acute. So it's, uh, mm -hmm. it's four weeks, but favorable seven days. And, uh, and uh, 
I, I, I'm, I'm lucky because I have people in the uh, uh, ER uh, 24 hours and, you know, my, my residents are called and consumed for any suspect, you know, septic arthritis, not only PJI, right? So, so we, we try to, to catch the situation very early, but answering to you, if it's been more than four, five, six days a week, I don't do that. Even if I identify the organism, because it's been too, too much, especially in IMR essay. Yeah, because we know. Oh, sorry. Uh, we know time is one of the factors that contribute to success, but it, it is not the only one. And it, it has been shown favorable, favorable outcomes in longer than that infection, provided that all the other stuff that is important uh, regarding polyethylene exchange, regarding antibiofilm therapy, if you have a staphylococcus, you need to, or your staphylococca, you need to, to add rifampin, if you have gram negative, you need to use ciprofloxacin. If you do all the other stuff correctly, time is one of the issues, but it is not the only issue. So that's why I was insisting on the question of times. And it's very surprising to see maybe because of cultural differences in the US, if you have more than one week, then you will not be there. You will do a two stage exchange. Even if you have two weeks of, of duration of infection, Right, this is very different from us. I think. It is again, guys. Uh, the legal issues, the medical legal issues here are strong, right? So if I, if I do if I do a, a, a DAPRI in uh, in somebody who has an infection for a week or ten days, and is a MRSA and it doesn't go well, and the patients have a recurrence of the infection, I can easily be ready to get a phone call from a lawyer. Easily, because the current literature says that it's not indicated a barrier in that situation. So, so again, we try to do the best for the patient, right? So uh, they, they sign a different consent when I do DAPRI. It's not the standard consent that I use for all my primary hip and knees and visual hip and knees. They sign a consent that say, this is a, this is a experimental uh, procedure. Uh, done to save the implant, but you know, uh, so it's a different concept because I'm a little bit worried about the legal issues like everybody is. But the timing, the timing, if it's again, the timing for me is very important. And if it's more than a, when a, than a week and a MRSA and you know, the, uh, or for example, you know, culture negative, I'm a little bit worried. So, Dr. Martinez, uh, you know, uh, again, with the time, I think the time for instance, the, symptoms, the onset of symptoms is very important for the acute hematogenous infection. For the post surgical infection, maybe it's connected, like say Ricardo, for other issues. Maybe in gram negative, is the, the metronomic sensitivity is high sensitivity to ciprofloxacin for quinolone. I, I have performed uh, the dye after memory two months with very well results. I think that the the time is, is very, maybe very straight for uh, acute hematogenous, but maybe for post-surgical, we have some other criteria that have involved, at least a year in, in Europe or in Spain, and maybe I think in Portugal is the same, no, Ricardo? Yeah, yeah. We, we, we will not do that so radical in, in post-operative uh, infections. We will be much more likely to, to do it there even after four to six weeks after the, the original procedure. We will definitely do it there unless the prosthesis is loose, soft tissues are bad, the patient is very, very ill. Uh, otherwise, we would be much likely to do it there in, in acute post-operative. Post okay. Okay. Um, um, Doctor, I can do, I can do yes, 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 of course. Uh, 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 yes, I'm, yes, I'm, do it. Yes, I will only talk about the drainage of the bone after the diet. After acute infection, uh, I use the diet to treat. The persistent drainage is one of the failure criteria, or at least an alarm sign to consider like a bad failure. Normally, with, with you do an astrosynthesis to push the knee, the negative uh, culture, because the patient normally is under treatment. 
But the literature shows that when you use a stimulant, maybe appear 4% of drainage of the bone, aseptic drainage. And what is your criteria to distinguish or to consider the drainage like a dead failure, or you to need to pay attention, or it's normal to the release of the cutting to space for the stimulant? What is your criteria in this case? So, so I, I tell the good, 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 very good point. Uh, I tell the patient, uh, Juan Carlos, that uh, more likely he will have some drainage from the knee. I tell him yeah. front. And uh, we are respecting and, uh, uh, you know, we put antibiotics and tell the patient that there is the elution process. And, and uh, so he might, he might have that. And I tell the patient, call us as soon as you can and we'll take care. But uh, it's something that I tell every single patient because as you guys, I see drainage, you know, quite often, okay, quite often. And uh, so it's something that is expected. But, uh, you know, the point is that I have one patient right now who's draining, right? Uh, we, we did, uh, we did uh, DAPRI on, on, on Monday. Uh, and, uh, uh, but, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's expected. And, uh, but I tell, I tell the patient in front. Okay. Dr. Indeli, uh, uh, I, I would like to uh, one question. Which step of the DAPRI do you think is the most important? Do I have to, to use every, 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 everything? Argon beam, chlorhexidine, pavidone, iodine, socket gauze, pacitracine stimulants. Which point, what's the point? What do you think is the most important or uh, do I have to use everything? Jose, uh, that's a great, great question. And the answer, and I told you uh, the beginning of our conversation uh, today, maybe I don't know. And, okay. And okay. I use that answer, I don't know right now, because really, I don't know. I think that a combination of all those things help the patients, right? But, uh, but uh, everything has a meaning, right? The methylene blue is direct to highlight the biofilm. Everything blue is contaminated. Okay, let's remove the blue, right? Then we know that there is the biofilm on the components, right? Okay, let's remove the, the biofilm. So how you, you kill bacterium with heat, right? We know that. So, so we started with the uh, electrocoagulator and then you still have bacterium there because you broke the biofilm, right? So now you have to remove it, the brush, the irrigation, right? Every step, and then you don't want that they, you know, if there is any, any, any uh, bacterium or, or, or focus of, of biofilm in, inside, you don't want that your new polish components, they get attacked again. So that's the reason you put the beads because the beads has been shown in, 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 the, in the lab, in, in, in basic science that they, 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 Goal of the beads is to protect the components from being reinfected, from being, again, new formation of the biofilm. So that's the reason that I use the beads. I use the beads because the antibiotic will, will stop the biofilm to recreate once I have cleaned it and washed it. And so that's, that's the reason that I don't know which is the best of, of those uh, you know, steps. Every yeah. step has a meaning, but uh, okay. Uh, yeah, doctor. Uh, in your paper, you use methylene blue only in 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 infected uh, knee. Do you use in in hip uh, in infections of, of the knee of the hip? You say good infected point. Hip? I don't use it in the hip. Why? For two reasons, right? So so so. Um, Sometimes, so uh, when I use it in the knee, I can see if there is a sinus tract. Did you see that picture that I show you with some blue, methylene blue leaking from the wound? There yeah. was a sinus tract. So if I do in the, at that point in that patient, in that patient, uh, that specific patient with the sinus tract, we didn't do the apri. Okay. We just explanted because the sinus tract. In the hip, it's very hard to do that. So first of all, you know, you, 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 you need the fluoroscopy, right? 
you know, need a fluoroscopy and you have to make sure that the needle is inside the joint and you can, you, you, you can inject your metal in blue. But for me, the metal in blue is also very important to see if there is a tract, a communication from the outside on the inside. Okay, do you uh, have, sorry. But you know, it's a good idea, you say, you know, we can, we, we can you know, we can share and, and see. It. Yeah. If, maybe you guys want to do it in a different way, but uh, the hip is a different animal, right? So uh, we don't have uh, uh, more time, I think. I don't know, Maria, what do you think? And if you oh. want Ricardo or, or Juan Carlos to ask one more question, I think I will finish if you want. And, and There's still uh, many, many participants. So if you have more questions, I think you can, you can do it. OK, so one more question, Maria. I don't hear you, sorry. Oh. I said that this is still uh, a big audience, so if okay. you have more questions. Okay, uh, okay. Do. So uh, we can stay a, a, a little bit more. So, Ricardo, do you have any qu any more questions? Yeah, I was very, very curious about the, the case that Professor Indelli just described. If you are using uh, ADAPRI for an acute case, and you told me you, you injected methylene blue, and you saw a communication and you called it a sinus tract. Well, in my acute cases, acute post-operative cases, all of them have such a communication from the inside to the outside. That's what, what caused the infection in most of them. It's, it's not really a sinus tract yet. It's just a, a wound that is not adequately, adequately closed and there is communication between the superficial um, and the deep compartments. Would that be an indication for to remove the prosthesis because there is a, a lack of, of, of a good sealage in the, in the, in the acute phase? Or, or is that a chronic case? I, I didn't understand your justification. Yeah, uh, there, is a, there is not a single answer there, Ricardo, right? So if you look at the uh, musculoskeletal, musculoskeletal Infection Society criteria, a sinus tract is a major criteria, right? In a chronic so, case, yes. Yeah. So, mm. so in, in the acute case, is a major criteria or not? I don't know. In, in my opinion, in an acute case, in a knee, that is not a sinus tract. That is a knee that is not yet closed, that is in communication with the outside. That is not a sinus tract. That is not a sign of chronicity. That a sinus tract is a sign of chronicity, for sure. And it is an infection, for sure. But in an ac acute knee, the knee is very superficial joint. It's very easy to have a communication from the joint to the, sub to the surface in the, in the acute phase. So I would not call it an, uh, a sinus tract, and I would not base it, the decision to remove the prosthesis on the communication of the methylene blue from the deep to the superficial, but but I understand your rationale, but I'm just asking, what, what do you think, Juan Carlos? I, I'm with you, but again, think about, uh, you know, the legal aspect of this, right? So, so, so you have, you have, you know, again, if the, you cannot call it sinus tract, but there is communication between the inside and the outside. I'm worried about, and I, you know, I, I, I do DAPRI for living, right? <laughs> but I don't know if that's, that's the right case, right? But it's a great point, Ricardo. So uh, maybe, you know, maybe in Europe things are a little bit different or so you feel more free to, to be a little bit more aggressive. I need to be a little bit more conservative because a sinus, here is a sinus tract. There is communication between inside and outside. In that case, major criteria, MS, SI, but I'm, but I'm open to discussion. <laughs> point, I agree with Ricardo. It's very normal that you have other problems with the close of the atrotomy. It's very, very typical in the knee. After three, four weeks, it's very Maybe is that the atrotomy is open and there is a communication between the prosthesis with the subcutaneous of the skin. For this reason, it's very common when the main criteria or main symptom is the acute post-surgical infection is the drain, the drain is the drainage from the knee. And 
In these cases, I must remove is eighty percent of the prosthesis after surgical post surgical infection, no acute infection. But I maybe the serious track, maybe the the blue methylene blue methylene is more to know that you have problem or you are not very clear the the diagnosis and but in fact to remove the processes but you have a communication with the blue methylene is is difficult for me to do that to do that no so like Ricardo maybe is the European way no Different. which is great they have no so they got pressure here. Can I ask you a question? How do you close your capsule? Because we use a Stratafix. We use Stratafix, which is a braided suture, right? In a running way, right? So we, we make a pretty tight closure of the capsule because we run it all the way up, all the way down and back, right? So how do you use, how you use your capsule? You close your capsule in, in the knee. I close with a continuous, normal retrieval suture, but a continuous, not uh, three points, you know? This, Correct. This, this. Okay. But now we are working with Pablo San, I think that he's here, here in, uh, the listening the presentation, the presentation, and we are working in the Spanish society to have criteria for close the bones after prosthesis. And we are working, and we are talking, and we are working a lot and studying the use uh, of Stratafix, but I have to reread the literature and it's very good to resolve. I think that in a month we have this protocol, uh, a society for orthopedy in Spain to achieve uh, a good close of the bone using Stratafix. So. Okay. Yeah, I'll, I, I also use, uh, sorry, can I just say one thing? Yeah, yes, yeah, of course, yes. I, 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 I the same with Juan Carlos. I've used a normal vicral continuous suture for, for many years, but I do really a very, very tight closure. I agree with all of you. It's very, very important. Persistent drainage is, it was a very high risk factor for infection. And now I'm also using Stratafix and I, I'm also using the, the premium uh, patch that you, that you talked about. And drainage is, is very, very low with, with using this, this one. But I think it's important here is to say that all this new stuff, this is just, uh, as, as Professor Indeli said it very, very nicely, this is all of it coming together. We don't know if this is the advantage of one thing, if this is the premium, if it's, if it's, is it the stimulant, is it the argon beam? All these things are little pieces that we must bring together to, to offer the best possible result. This is not one magic solution for, for everything. And stimuli is also not a magic solution. It's just an antibiotic delivery option, right? I, I agree, Ricardo. Uh, one, uh, we have one question, uh, uh, Maria from Marta Sabater, I think. Uh, I read, but I can see the question. If you, if oh. you trust, okay. Um, it was very similar to one of the questions you made, so it's been already answered. Okay, so if you can make it. So it, uh, there is no part of the questions uh, from the audience. There is no? No, because the, the question from Dr. Sabater was very similar to, to one of the questions okay. you made. Okay, 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 thank you. So if you uh, want, Ricardo, uh, new uh, questions or something like that, you can add something. Okay, uh, Dr. Indeli, uh, it's been a fantastic presentation. Uh, uh, I would like to thank MBA. I would like to thank Dr. Juan Carlos. I, I would like Ricardo Sousa. And of course, in Delhi, you have made an, an effort. You are working and you, you are with us. So I'm happy for that. And um, I want you to come here to Spain and to Valencia and Barcelona. And I, I, I would like to go to Porto, Ricardo, as well. So thank you you'll be welcome when we can all travel back okay i will go with 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 dr juan carlos okay and sure, to san francisco sure. and stanford so thank you uh, very much thank you mba and ricardo you want uh, say some words or, uh, or juan carlos for say goodbye 
Now, for me, Jeff, thank you for okay. having me and thank you for inviting me. It was a pleasure listening to Professor Indali. Thank you. Okay. So, thank you for to, to, to share this hour, more than an hour with Professor Indali. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. So, let's go. Thank you, Dr. Indali. Bye-bye. Uh, Thank Everybody. you so much for having me. It was great. And, you know, you have my email, any ideas, any things that you want to add, change, mm. you know, this is the okay. video, uh, ongoing, right? So I'm super open to keep, that. Okay. Things, keep in that. touch, do things the same way, try to find common grounds. Would be, it's just great. It was great to talk to you. Thank okay. you. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.